I killed him to be free, to move forward in my life. Echo Episode 4 is loaded with Marvel Easter eggs and symbolism, and it oh so subtly paints Wilson Fisk as a colonizer trying to separate Maya from her people. Welcome back, Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in Episode 4 of Echo to Loa. We're going to break this whole episode down for you, but mostly, I am excited to break down Vincent D'Onofrio's brilliant portrayal of Wilson Fisk and how this show connects back to Daredevil, Born Again, and the future of the MCU. And in honor of the Kingpin's return, we have designed this Return of the King shirt for sale right now in our merch store, ScreenCrushMerch.com, where we design all the merch ourselves. We also have this Nelson and Murdoch shirt with a vigilante holding the scales of justice, this Nelson and Murdoch Law and Order parody tee, Echo in Sign Language, and of course, Doug as Daredevil. And guys, we also have our very first Screen Crush live show on February 22nd in Brooklyn, New York. Link for the tickets is below. You can meet the team, see exclusive videos. It's going to be a great time. Now, the title of this episode has a special meaning. Taloa is the name of Maya's mother, and her name means to sing. So every episode of this series is named named after one of Maya's ancestors, beginning with Chaffa and the Choctaw creation story, then Loak being threatened with exile, followed by Tuklo wanting to become a light horse warrior like the men. And the final episode of the series is going to be titled Maya, because all of these women and their struggles have been leading up to Maya's story and adding their strength to her. So each of these women's stories parallels Maya's in these episodes. The creation episode was Maya's origin story. Loak was threatened with exile as Maya's grandmother had exiled her. And of course, both she and Tuklo fight as warriors. And in this episode, we see how her grandmother actually struggled to bring her mother into this world. And later, she talks about how her mother's death ended up shattering their family. But Maya also finds out that her mother was a healer, so now it is up to her to heal these family bonds that were broken years ago. Now, this episode may not be as action-packed, but it is loaded with personal drama. Wilson Fisk wants to separate Maya from her family once and for all. Wait, what do you mean by that? Well, like he told her in Hawkeye. You and I were family. He's trying to supplant her family and become the only family she has. And in this episode, we see that. We see that Fisk's true threat is that he can divide Maya from her actual family, from the tribe of people who really love her. But, but he says that he loves her. I love and I think he probably does think that he loves her, but Fisk only ever wants people in his life who make him feel better like Vanessa. Oh yeah, here's Vanessa again. Look, if you want to know about Vanessa, we have a recap of everything about Wilson Fisk and Daredevil you need to know before this show. It's up on the channel right now. Check it out. And Fisk also collects people that he just thinks would be useful. I mean, probably the real reason he's been conditioning Maya for years is because he's looking for a secret weapon to use against Daredevil. And I think we're going to see the repercussions of this show in Daredevil Born Again. Hey, uh, by the way, person, how come you're wearing glasses today? Ah, you like them? Well, check this out. Eh? Whoa, how did you change your glasses so fast? Ah, uh, because, Doug, this is actually a magnetic top frame from Pair Eyewear, our partner for this video. This is so cool because if you wear glasses like I do, then you know they can be like a really expensive fashion accessory. Like, these frames all have different Marvel characters on them. They're a lot of fun. But, like, if I wanted something more muted, I could switch to the same panels, but in black and white. Or I even have this Black Panther-themed top frame. So, with Pair Eyewear, you can buy affordable prescription glasses that are also customizable, with some of these top frames going for as little as $25. Now, they have more than 650 unique top frames, including DC, Marvel, Sports, Peanuts, Harry Potter, with new exclusives releasing every month. Now, I should also tell you that these aren't even prescription glasses. They're blue light lenses, which help me look at screens. So now, I don't hurt my eyes when I play video games for too long. So, the way this works is, you click our link in the description, and you go to their virtual try-on, where you can pick from 13 base frames and square, round or cat eye shapes with a large range of colors. And they also offer premium plus lenses for higher prescriptions, light responsive lenses, or progressive lenses. And there's also free shipping for orders over $45. And guys, look, if you find out these are not right for you, they have a 30-day return policy with no questions asked. So to get 15% off your first pair, click our link in the description and use our code. You will not regret it. These things are awesome. All right, now back to Echo. In this episode, under the Marvel Spotlight logo, we hear the sounds of New York City. 2008, just one year after my Maya and her father moved to the city. Now, we have seen in previous flashbacks that her uncle Wilson visited her at karate practice, so probably at this point, he's already just taken a shine to little Maya. But this is the moment when he truly begins to care for her in his own warped way. Maya gets bullied by a street vendor. Now, in the Netflix Daredevil series, nothing would make Kingpin lose his temper more than when people hurt his beloved Vanessa. He decapitated a guy with a car door just because he embarrassed him in front of his date. <laughs> And now we see him being equally defensive of Maya. I mean, seriously, this is terrifying. Clear! 
And look, even though the Kingpin is the bank, even though he has everything to lose by getting caught murdering a guy in broad daylight, he beats this guy to death simply because he wants to. <laughs> So let's really break this scene down because this is actually one of the most important moments in Maya's life. Kingpin is wearing his white suit and it gets tainted with red blood. And what does he immediately ask for? Need a new jacket because he doesn't want Maya to see him this way. In the show Daredevil, the Kingpin was such a compelling villain because he was obsessed with purity. He wanted to make the city clean, to make it pure. And this is one of the reasons he was obsessed with the painting, Rabbit in a Snowstorm. It reminded him of purity, of that wall he would stare at as a child that I'm going to explain later. But in the Daredevil finale, that same painting was tainted with red blood, just like Wilson's dream of a pure New York was tainted by his own violent actions. And just like how his suit is stained with blood right here. Now his first instinct is to hide this violent self away from Maya to keep her innocent and pure. In the Daredevil series, he initially had the same instinct regarding Vanessa. But when Maya sees him, she's not afraid of him. She joins him. Good. And at this moment, Fisk recognizes her as a kindred spirit, someone else who also faced childhood trauma and who finds comfort in violence. I mean, the real reason Kingpin loves Maya is because she makes him feel like he's not alone, that there are other people in the world who take pleasure and violence and hurting people. And then we cut to 2021 during the blip. Now, this is after Ronan kills her father, and I'm pretty sure this is before he sends her on that first mission that we saw back in episode one. You're ready to move from the theoretical to the practical. So there's a few things to notice in this scene. One, look at Maya's jacket. It looks like the same one her father was wearing when they left Oklahoma in 2007. It could be that she's wearing his clothes to remember him, but it's a subtle way to show that she has not let go of his death. Also, Fisk has a painting hanging above Maya of an American flag with these like layered images of a hammer and machines, much like the layered effects of the opening credits. But a few things to note about this painting. One, the hammer is foreshadowing the one that he gives her later in the episode, which believe me, we're gonna talk about in a bit. And two, the entire episode is casting Wilson Fisk as a white colonizer who was trying to separate Maya from her heritage and homeland and family. In the 1800s, this was the same role that many American soldiers played when they drove the Choctaw Nation from their ancestral lands, hence the appearance of the American flag. What do you mean? Well, Fisk is trying to become Maya's new family, and he wants her to come back with him to New York. In other words, he wants her to leave behind her heritage and relocate to a place that he chooses. Not only that, but he also wants her to conform to his way of communication. Instead of learning how to sign, he forces her to use technology so it's easier for him to communicate with her. This is similar to how some white settlers and missionaries would force natives to learn new languages and basically force them to change where they lived, how they lived, their entire way of life. But I gotta say, just about Echo's contacts, going forward, they are gonna make it easier for her to team up with heroes like Daredevil and Spider-Man and other heroes who may not know sign language. It's like a sci-fi narrative shortcut that's probably gonna stick around past the events of this show. Do you understand me? Is my universal translator working? Hey, I got a question. Why did they kill that really nice lady? Oh yeah, that was hard, wasn't it? Notice how they had already strung up this plastic to hide the evidence, and they killed her right around the corner because they knew that Maya couldn't hear her screams. No! It's the kind of cold and efficient killing you would expect from Wilson Fisk. And to answer your question, they would have killed her because she is a potential witness to crimes that Wilson and Maya may have discussed. So back to the present day, where Fisk shows up wanting to have a nice Sunday dinner like they used to. And then we see that she did not shoot his eye out. She only grazed him and gave him a really bad scar. Or look, maybe like we've been theorizing, maybe Fisk does have a little bit of that power broker super soldier serum in him, and that makes him a really fast healer. Maya says that she used to see him as a hero. And like I said earlier, Wilson Wilson sees himself as a hero, as a hero who sacrifices his own soul to save his city. I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy to defeat them. I burn my decency for someone else's future. Now, earlier I talked about how Maya is drawing from the experience of her ancestors in the present day. And there's an interesting little camera trick in this scene when we see her POV shots. The edge of the lens is a bit distorted, like we're looking through a fisheye lens. This is the same effect used during Loak's stickball game in episode two. In a way, the game is reflected in this scene. Maya is playing a game with Wilson Fisk, trying to escape from under his control, just like freeing the ball in that game of stickball we saw in episode two. She pours out the wine 
mind and instead gets a Shasta Cola, probably the worst soda of all time. Now, this gesture pays off later Owen, but her grandma gets her a pop. Russ, Russ pop. I, it's what we call soda in the Midwest. And the fact that her grandmother offers Maya a drink that she actually wants, while the Kingpin offers her a drink that he wants her to have, uh, that goes back to that theme I talked about of Fisk trying to control her while her family simply accepts her. He also brings her Levain cookies made in a famous bakery in New York. And I gotta tell you, the cookies are good, but a little overrated. The double chocolates are good though. I can't have the chocolate ones because I will die. It's true. Now, several times in this scene, we think the Kingpin is going to kill Maya or seek to take revenge. Like when these goons hold open her eyes, I thought that he was literally going to try to take an eye for an eye. But then he offers her the knife. Because he doesn't want to kill her, he wants to control her. He wants her to submit so she can be his heir and eventually help him take down Daredevil. Now, rumor has it that the plot of Daredevil Born Again would have had Wilson Fisk running for mayor. So it would make sense if he wanted Maya to take over all his criminal operations so he could be clean for public perception. So this offer seems like a good deal for Maya until later when Black Crow tells her that Fisk killed or threatened everyone he loved just to keep controlling him. After Fisk had Maya's father killed, he sent Black Crow back to Oklahoma. And like Maya says later on, this was to further isolate her from her family so she would be easier to control. And then we cut to the Choctaw Nation powwow that Chola was planning a couple episodes ago. Now, in our episode two breakdown, I pointed out that the festival was meant to parallel the great Choctaw stickball match that opened up that episode. This showed how far the people have fallen. <laughs> And here we see that the modern day gatherings of the Choctaw are a far cry from their pre-colonial heights. And then Chola gets visions of her ancestors at the same time as Maya, sending Maya into a trance-like state. And I should note that this looks like Maya is having a seizure. And in many ancient cultures, epilepsy was believed to be a kind of holy affliction that would bring someone closer to God. Similar to how Maya's trance brings her divine visions of her ancestors. She sees several flashes of her grandmother giving birth, looking at a spiral in the ceiling that's a reflection of the pool and the Choctaw creation myth. Because remember, as we're seeing Maya see these visions, we're also seeing her ancestors having visions as well. For instance, in Tuklo's vision of the pool, she is framed the exact same way as Chaffa, the first Choctaw, over the shoulder and looking into the spiral of water. This is connecting all of these women and their experiences. They each had a moment when they connected with their ancestors or they peered into the ancestral plane. I should also mention that a trance-like state to see one's ancestors was also something we saw in Black Panther. They enter a kind of trance where they can speak to their loved ones from the past. And then her grandmother confirms that all these visions are triggered by life or death situations. So in the creation myth, we also see the cave collapsing just before Chaffa led her people out into the sun. And we broke down that myth in our episode one Easter egg video. Check it out if you haven't already. So Chola explains explains all of this ancestry connection to her granddaughter and tells her that in order for her mother's birth to succeed, she had to be in the woods among her sisters. And this is tying back to the series idea of strength through family. Like in the very first scene of this show, Maya tells Bonnie that she considers her to be her sister. And as this episode is showing, being close to her family is what gives Maya her real strength, while being close to Kingpin actually weakens her spirit. And then Cholo spells out the theme of this show. Decorations. By the way, we called that subtext like two episodes ago. After Maya leaves, her grandmother goes to look at some clothes that she is tailoring. Now my guess is that she was originally creating an outfit for Maya's mother, but then she stopped after her mother passed away. Why do you think that? Well, last episode, Scully told Maya that her grandmother didn't touch the old house after her father took her away. Instead, her grandmother held onto the past, preserving it almost like a museum. And she tells Maya in this episode that she reminds her so much of her mother. So it looks like her grandmother is making her a superhero outfit, and I just think it would be very appropriate and touching if these were clothes that she was originally making for her mom, but now she's augmenting with these armor pieces I'll talk about later on. And while I'm on the subject, the clothes have a circular sun symbol, which Maya wears on her jacket and on her shirt in this episode, and we see her use this in the comics. This is a modification of the Choctaw sun symbol. This symbol means continuous happiness through all stages of life. So this symbolizes the connection between the lives of Maya and her ancestors and this power that binds them all. All right, so later in the episode, we do see her grandmother creating what looks like armor for her, at least like shoulder pads and knee pads. Yeah, why is she suddenly making her armor? Well, maybe when she saw the visions of Tuklo as a warrior, she understood that this was Maya's new path. Now, I gotta say, there's a really cool tradition of mothers making superhero costumes for their kids. So a lot of you like might have watched this and thought of Ms. Marvel, but really, this tradition goes all the way back to Superman, when Martha Kent made his suit from the clothes he was wrapped in as a baby. Cool costume. Thanks. 
My mom made it for me. And then Alison Krauss's beautiful song Down on the River to Pray starts to play, a song made famous for its inclusion of the movie Oh Brother Where Art Thou. Now in that movie, the song is being sung by churchgoers about to be baptized. The preacher done washed away all my sins and transgressions. And the lyrics are about people seeking spiritual fulfillment, exactly what Maya is looking for in this episode. And then we briefly go to Biscuits and the car mechanic on this beautiful magic hour shot of a junkyard. The mechanic says, Everything the light touches is yours. Which, as Biscuit points out, is from this. And they're from Lion King? It's kind of lame. They just called out that reference. Yeah, right? I mean, just like, just like say it and let it sit there, you know? Let us enjoy the Easter egg. But this is not just a throwaway Easter egg. As a friend of the channel, Mike Mazzella, pointed out, much like Simba, Maya has to defeat her evil uncle who has a scar on his eye. Then there's a montage of the other people in Maya's life, looking sad and off into the distance. And look, I gotta tell you, I have really enjoyed this show, especially the first couple episodes. It has been like extraordinary in some places. But this is one of those times when I really think we should have had more episodes. This has been the weakness of a lot of Marvel shows. They're just like really quick movies, they're one off, and we don't get a chance to really dive into these characters. What do you mean? Well, like, we, we don't really know any of these people. Like, Henry Black Crow just told us a lot about his life, but we're not ever shown anything. We don't know if he has a wife or kids or if he's ever even been in love. Because the show is so short, we've had a lot of characters telling us things instead of a show that actually just gets to tell us stories. So you're saying the show is so good that it leaves you wanting more. I guess. So then Maya goes to the Kingpin's Hotel to finish him off for good. And this is where she calls him out for basically being a colonizer. But then, ah, this is so good. He cuts to the core of his own psychosis. I know now that I failed you. The same as my father failed me. What's he mean by that? Well, in one episode of Daredevil, we see Wilson Fisk as a child. His dad, like he says here, was an abusive man. But he also wanted Wilson to grow up to be an abusive man. You gotta show him that you're a man. Kick him. And he would make Wilson stare at this white wall while he beat his mother in the next room. So this was the root of Wilson's obsession with achieving purity while also blinding innocence from his violence. In that flashback, he ends up killing his dad with the same hammer we see here, the hammer that he also used to post campaign signs for his dad's failed bid for city council. So this tool that symbolized his father's lack of success actually became Wilson's first step to success, his first step to achieving control. Hey, Ryan? Yeah, Colton. Oh, by the way, Colton's the guy who's trapped eternally in our television set, but doesn't know it. What is it? Well, actually, it's not the same hammer. You see, that's a ball peen hammer. And in the flashbacks we saw in Daredevil, Fisk killed his dad with a claw hammer like this. Wait, why do you even have that? Don't worry about it. Now, this could just be a continuity error or maybe a little hint that this isn't the exact same universe from before. But my guess is that Kingpin didn't actually keep the hammer all these years. And he probably disposed of it like you would any murder weapon. Now, I'm guessing that Kingpin probably asked one of his guys to just run out and get him a hammer so that he could pretend as if he kept the hammer all these years and then use it as a prop in his bid for Maya. So with the hammers being different, I think that means that this was likely just another form of control and manipulation by Kingpin to Maya. Okay, fine, but what's important here is that when he offers this information to Maya, he is sharing the most intimate part of himself. Because if Maya is violent like him, then he knows that he is not a monster, that he is not alone. It's a little bit like Palpatine offering Luke a lightsaber to strike him down in Jedi. By offering Maya this power, if she takes it, she proves that she is like him. And if she doesn't take it, then it means that she wants to be his heir. I should also point out, not the first time we've seen a father figure in the MCU offer a potential heir a hammer. As Odin said in the first Thor movie, it's a weapon to destroy or as a tool to build. In the same way, Wilson is telling her, you could use this hammer to destroy me, or you can use it to help build an empire with me. But also, when the Kingpin admits that he has become like his father, he is confirming his worst fear, that he has grown up to be a violent sociopath like his dad. See, for decades, he wore his dad's old cufflinks specifically to prove the opposite to himself. That's why I still wear these, to remind myself that I'm not cruel for the sake of cruelty. But now, after years as the kingpin of crime, he admits that he will always see himself as a monster. And he needs Maya to tell him that he's not a monster because she loves him. And then she'll help him kill Daredevil. Exactly. And finally, he tells her to come home to New York. Again, this is the push-pull between Maya's actual home with her tribe in Oklahoma and her fake home with Kingpin's empire in New York City. Maya goes through several flashbacks, including the only sign that Kingpin ever learned. 
Well, so he did learn sign language. Yeah, but it's like the easiest sign to learn, the one they teach you in kindergarten. But the final image Maya sees here is of her mother. Her mother's death is what sent her on this journey. That was the event that broke her home and sent her into the arms of a false family, Kingpin's Empire. But by returning to Oklahoma, Maya has reestablished her spiritual link with her mother and her ancestors. And this is what will finally allow her to break the cycle of violence that originally killed her mother. The episode ends with Fisk losing his temper, followed by a cut to black. Now, I kind of think he's going to take off the kid gloves and go for revenge now. But episode five has been out for a few days, so I'm not going to go into theories too much. Instead, let me know what you thought of the episode and the series as a whole down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.